My name is Marissa Payne. I'm the Gazette Cedar Rapids government reporter. Um, and welcome all of you to this panel on the future of development and the community development track. Uh, so today we'll talk about traditional space and communities alongside development projects that have had to pause due to the challenges of, you know, all the challenges of 2020. Um, you know, how can these projects move forward, um, bringing past and present into future economic opportunities. Um, attendees are welcome to join in the discussion by using the Whova chat feature. Please feel free to pop in with questions at any time. Um, you know, Todd will send those to me and I'll ask those to our panelists. Um, so let's welcome our three panelists here today. We have with us Bethany Wilcoxon, a senior advisor with McClure Engineering Company in the Des Moines area, Nate Kading, the business development director with Build to Suit, and Mike Whelan, the president and CEO of Heart of America Group. Um, so thanks to all of you for being here. And uh, before we kick things off, uh, can you tell us a bit more about yourselves and your backgrounds with development? I'll go first. If you, can you hear me, Marissa? Yes. Okay, well, uh, 42 years ago, I opened a 100-seat restaurant called the Iowa Machine Shed, which I thought was going to be a six-month venture uh, to help out with a vacant building my dad owned, and found out that I liked it and, and uh, found it fun. And since then, we've uh, built a company with uh, about 45 properties, primarily in hotels and commercial real estate, but we still operate 20 plus restaurants. And so uh, we're unique in the sense that we design it with our own architectural and design staff. We have our own construction wing and then we own it and operate it long term. So uh, we're kind of a soup to nuts, vertically integrated uh, development company, but we still think of ourselves as hospitality people. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Bethany? Yeah, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Bethany Wilcox I'm with McClure Engineering. We are a civil engineering firm. Uh, my background is in city planning. So we get into the full gamut, of course, the infrastructure for projects, uh, but also actual land development with some mixed use development. Uh, our planning focus, of course, is on a lot of our smaller communities around the state. And a lot of that really gets to our quality of life amenities. So looking at what is there for people to do in these communities, uh, as well as housing opportunities. Of course, we need those uh, homes to make sure that people can thrive in these communities. Uh, so excited to talk more about that a little later on. Great. Uh, first, thank you, Marissa, and thank you to, to the Gazette for putting on um, <clears throat> this event. I know it's been going on for a few years, and it's uh, always been a, been a highlight. I've been an attendee a few times, so thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Nate Kading. I'm probably the newcomer to the real estate development game here. Uh, I enjoyed a nine year career out in San Diego uh, as a professional athlete, moved back to Iowa where I was born and raised here and, and working now with Build the Suit Incorporated. We're a um, design, build, construction management firm um, that also has some folks like myself that work in the real estate development. Uh, we have offices in the Quad Cities and here in Coralville. And we do a wide variety of construction, real estate development, but mostly based around uh, commercial and office. Um, and we're working on a couple fun projects up in the Cedar Rapids area uh, currently that I'm sure we'll get into later. Awesome. Yep. Thank you all. Um, and, and just to get a reminder for everyone before we start to use the Whova, Whova chat feature to ask any questions at any point during this panel. Um, yeah. So to start with you all, what are some ways, you know, pre pandemic um, that you've seen communities creatively thinking about their available space and, you know, thinking about how to really, activate the unique assets of their community? You know, what does that look like in a state like Iowa where we don't have mountains or oceans or things like that? Well, I can jump in, uh, give you an example that our team is fortunate to be involved with in Fort Dodge. Uh, like many communities around the state, there's an old mall in the middle of town, primary list state, uh, but just really underused, lots of vacancy there. Uh, so our team had the opportunity to get involved with that project uh, right about a year ago. Uh, the city was wanting to do something with that. So we got involved, uh, of course, pre-pandemic. So uh, plans for redevelopment. The vision is that it will be a mixed use center that will have retail, hotel, housing, office space, lots of green space as well. Of course, at the time, we didn't realize how important that outdoor gathering space would be. 
uh, but all of those different pieces in the midst of town and then also looking to uh, support the tax rolls, of course. So that's been uh, something that's been ongoing, again, getting back to those quality of life elements that we really make sure we're bringing the communities together and weaving that social fabric into the development. One thing I've witnessed in the last few years is uh, a dramatic turnaround in Iowa's thinking. I think that uh, 30 years ago, there was a plant it or forge it mentality. If you didn't plant it or forge it, it wasn't a real, real job. And there, there was the idea that those primary jobs were at the base of, of what created uh, an economy and that things like amenities, parks, bike trails, water trails, things to do were the icing on the cake, but it was just the icing on the cake. It wasn't critical. And uh, I remember trying to pitch that the idea is that you needed to turn that pyramid upside down and that the amenity base it was critical to attracting the creative class and bringing the young, younger professionals uh, and people that wanted to be in a community that can make it. And I think a lot of Iowa gets that today. They didn't get that. 20, even 20 or 25 years ago. So I think what you're seeing is communities increasingly looking and saying, what can we do to make it fun and cool to live here? Uh, I'll never forget about 10 years ago, a friend of mine called and said, you know, my son just got his MBA and I asked him what, what company he's working for. And he said, well, dad, I'm moving to Atlanta. And he said, well, why? He says, well, I want to live in Atlanta. I'm going to get a job there. And, and my, my friend couldn't get it. And I think that sums up the, the modern thing is people are the young people that can drive a community ahead are looking for a place they want to live and then a place that they can get a job almost second. Yeah, I think Mike hit it on the head. I'm involved with a, a company called Big Grove Brewery and we did a, an adaptive reuse of a 40,000 square foot warehouse in uh, Iowa City, just, just south of downtown. And um, that was a big component for us was you know, just enhancing the quality of life of the community. It's been really well received. It's been open now about three years, but there's a very large outdoor component to it. With fire pits, there's playground structures for kids. There's stuff to do inside. It's adjacent to bike paths and parks. And I'm um, as someone that was born and raised in Iowa, went to California and came back, that really is a, a main driver for decisions for folks my age and they're in their mid thirties about where they want to live are those quality of life amenities. And Marissa hit it on the head. We're not going to grow any mountains or uh, create any oceans anytime soon in Iowa, but it's really beholden upon all of us as development in development and, you know, just uh, in gov the municipal government of trying to harness the assets that we do have and try to help facilitate uh, projects like a big grove that can become great community assets um, and can drive a lot of development around it. The big grove now has over 450 multifamily apartment units just around it within that same development. So you can kind of see these sort of quality of life anchors like a hotel that Mike might have um, you know, it, or restaurants really kind of serve as anchors for development and then the development kind of grows around that as well too. And, and certainly I know we're going to talk about it more, but even though we're only an eight, eight month out of the year sort of state in terms of weather, being able to be outside, the outdoor space is, is critically important, both the public shared outdoor space and then also the, the private outdoor space as well. So um, those, those, are, those have been big drivers for us down in Big Grove in Iowa City. Yeah, thank you. Big fan of Big Grove myself. I spent, you know, my birthday weekend here just this past weekend. Um, yeah. Um, so what types of partnerships in Iowa have been, you know, really key to helping communities advance major developments? And um, what might this look like in smaller rural communities compared to larger urban areas? Um, Bethany, since, you know, you have um, some experience working with those smaller communities, perhaps you can start off there. Yeah, you know, the, the cliche public-private partnerships. Uh, it is so hard on the development side to be encouraged to take the risk to get out of these metro areas where you're uh, more assured of those returns for your development. So thinking creatively about these partnerships, I see Jenna Ramsey from Stanton is with us this morning. Uh, Stanton has been just a fabulous example of what we can do when the community comes together and works towards those common goals. Uh, they have uh, what's called the Stanton Area Industrial Foundation. So that's been a private group uh, working on housing development there or redevelopment. Uh, if you go to Stanton, the worst house in town has a few paint chips that are missing. And that is absolutely a testament to the partnerships that they've been able to develop there in a town of under 700 people. 
So it doesn't matter the community size, but partnership, partnership, partnership is the key to success. One of the things I've found is if a community, uh, particularly a smaller community, struggles with the idea of creating a public partnership, whether it's the use of TIF or other incentives, I think sometimes uh, a good developer will play a role in helping them understand how to utilize those tools. In particular, I say uh, uh, a judicious use of TIF and other incentives is two things. Number one, are you going to accelerate something into your community that's catalytic that the market might take 10 or 15 years to get, but with, with uh, you spurring it with incentives, you can get it done in the next two or three years and it will have a catalytic effect. That's the first use of those incentives. The second use is, are you going to take something that the market might otherwise uh, provide to your community, but increase the quality and the cool factor of it enough that it's going to uh, really make a difference. And it's something that maybe is, a, is cooler, more exciting than what the market might ordinarily deliver. And we had a project and we're still working on it, the Guaranteed Bank project down in downtown uh, Cedar Rapids, taking the old Guarantee Bank building, the World Theater, the Strand Theater, as some people call it, and combining it with a new build tower and having a, a, a dual brand Marriott with a rooftop bar and a Johnny's. And uh, obviously the market couldn't deliver that without a public-private partnership, and number one, and it would be a creative in, in, in terms of qualitative impact. And, and finally, it adds a real cool factor to the community. Thanks. Uh, just before Nate jumps in, um, in case there are any newcomers here to development lingo, um, can you talk about what tax increment financing exactly is? Tax increment financing basically says we're going to take uh, part or sometimes even most of the uh, a property tax stream and sometimes some other streams like a uh, so in some cases, very narrow cases, sales tax or pillow tax, and provide it to the project uh, to support it and then to, to get it going. And it's uh, I think in times it's been controversial, sometimes it's been misused, but as I said, if you take that future income stream of property taxes or other taxes and devote it to the right kind of projects, it can definitely be not only catalytic, but uh, really beneficial to the community. Awesome. Thank you for that. Nate, I think the, the yeah. simple thing I've observed the last few years is working in a couple different municipalities is just sort of from the government's perspective is just sort of this start with yes mentality. You know, if a developer comes in with a, with a specific idea or a designer, um, having someone on staff at the city that can kind of help serve as that liaison and that facilitate, facilitator then kind of say at the beginning, like, hey, this is a great idea. Now let's think about the pragmatic things that we have to solve for and, and able to, in, in order to accomplish that idea. I think some other cities that we've worked in are still behind. I know I'm not trying to curry any favor with the city of Cedar Rapids, but I think they do an amazing job. They've got an economic development department that sits within the city manager's office that sort of serves as that liaison and helps walk you through the various components with the building department, with the other folks. Whereas some other municipalities, you just kind of get dumped right into there their building department, and then all of a sudden you're, you're talking about the not fun stuff, right? Like setbacks and height and scale and all these things that you got to solve for, you know? So I think the cities, especially in Iowa, places that really need to go out of their way uh, to continue to encourage, you know, creative development um, from outside of the box thinking, of course, within the parameters of, of, of what's allowable by code, but, you know, starting with, hey, this, this, is, this is great. This would be great for our community, and we might have to tweak a few things here and there, but but uh, we as the city are gonna work with you in order to try and accomplish this vision. Yeah, and can you also talk you know, about that kind of push and pull between the developers, um, you know, their plan for a project and um, how that evolves over time with community needs and community input along with um, you know, what kind of assets of a city that city officials are hoping to unlock with the project? Yeah, I think, you know, as, as a develop, as a developer or business owner, I think you, it's 
beholden on the developer to have a development that meets the community's needs. That's business 101, right? You have to, you have to provide a, a service or something that's, that's fulfilling a need or solving a problem. That's, that's a business not only in real estate development, but any business for that matter. So it's beholden upon the developer to do their homework from that standpoint. If it's a multifamily development, do you want studio apartments or two bedroom apartments or you know, townhouses or 20 story buildings? And, and then you got to, um, you know, the, the, the city has to then sort of play traffic cop and say, hey, we, we do want a 20 story building that needs to go here in this zone. And then you go there. So I think it's, it's the developer's job to find, to bring about a, a product that's going to meet the demand of the community. Um, or maybe push them even further in a, in a different direction that they have the vision with. And then it's the, the city's job to kind of play traffic cop to kind of help make that work in the right, in the right spot, according to zoning. Yeah. Um, so of course, COVID-19 has paused a lot of major developments this year, um, especially in the spring months when, you know, we knew even less than we know now about the virus um, so I guess before we get into that discussion, um, can we provide everyone with some examples of specific projects, um, that you or panelists might be involved with that have, um, you know, been affected by the pandemic? Yeah, I, I can jump back to our Fort Dodge example, you know, so demolition of the mall is underway. Um, we've got some other, uh, entities that are going in right now. Conversations have been ongoing with some other potential tenants for us for different uh, lots on the site. Some of those have moved ahead. Those particular uh, businesses are feeling bullish. Uh, some have slowed, you know, not to say that they've stopped completely, uh, but, you know, it's just that shifting schedule that we've seen. Um, so that's been our biggest piece, but it is still moving forward. Uh, we have our structural team also that works with uh, some hotel developers. And again, that's been a mixed bag across the country. Um, some are moving full steam ahead and others are pumping the brakes a little bit. Well, I can give one very close to home example is our project in downtown Cedar Rapids. Uh, we, we had a record setting, a 42 year record setting January, same with the February and we were headed to a record setting March. And then all of a sudden in about 48 hours, we were basically out of business. We're still partially, uh, probably about 40% still uh, out of business compared to where we were last year. And I think what we've been very honest with is our public partners. Uh, we've said, look, we have an abandoned division. We're going to try to find a way ahead. Uh, we're honest about here's maybe our, our less, more limited ability to do what we were planning on doing just a few short months ago. Uh, but let's figure a path forward uh, and uh, let's assume that we're going to have a rock in 2021 and uh, let's let's get ready right now. And, and we've re-engaged with, uh, for example, the city of Cedar Rapids and the state of Iowa with regard to that project and they're trying to get figure a way uh, to a path forward. Yeah, I think it specifically uh, from our company, Build the Suit Incorporated, you know, we're, we've got a dozen different construction projects currently underway and COVID has really uh, brought about a wide variety of challenges, but probably none more so just in, in timing and delays and postponements. I mean, we've going from a 2000 square foot office build out to a $10 million apartment building. If you're thinking of all the various thousands of pieces that need to be put in place to finish a construction project. If one factory in Wisconsin gets pushed back and your, and your balconies can't come in or your you know, the water faucet handle can't come in here. It's, it's impossible to deliver a space at 100% done like your client needs. So it's been challenging, certainly in that world with all the various disruptions that COVID has. And it's just been a, it's been a time thing. I know we all experienced that in, in all, all, all different aspects of life now during COVID too, but it's especially felt in, in construction and development as, you know, we're always on timelines and working towards accomplishing things. Um, you know, that I think COVID has brought about some real challenges just in terms of of, uh, of delays and postponing projects and those sort of things. Yeah, so from I'm what, go ahead. Oh, I'm great. Laughing. Go ahead, Mike. I'm, I'm laughing, Nate, because you were very <laughs> diplomatic. We, we had the brilliance to have three hotel projects finished in July of this year, uh, two new construction, one uh, total, total renovation and remodel more than just a uh, lipstick. Uh, and uh, it was a pretty much a, 
a full-time job morning, noon, and night to manage the supply chain. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. It was just nuts. And uh, for a while there, it was, you didn't know what, whether the stuff was going to show up and uh, <laughs> you had to get mad at some people. You had to sweet talk some other people, but uh, that said, I think things are rapidly returning pretty much to normal. And me, as, as for me, I'm not a believer in new normals. There's a reason normal was normal, and that's the way people like to live. <laughs> There's some truth in that, for sure. And, uh, we have an audience question that I'll, I'll pose to you all before we um, continue with our other questions. Um, do you have any advice or experience with overcoming a more traditional mindset one that may be opposed to things like mis mixed use developments, spending on amenities, or otherwise entrenched in the no mentality? Well, I think there are a lot of studies out there from across the country um, that show the benefit of those kind of developments. Um, and then of course, there's also the intrinsic side of it as well. But what we always say is that, you know, if it's a, a community or a particular project, it comes down to the leadership that has that vision. So helping build that coalition and educating people about why these opportunities are really beneficial uh, for communities. You know, you're not going to have a mixed use development everywhere, uh, but you know, you look at the density, the tax base, all of that good stuff. So um, education and leadership. A few years ago, I was working with a community that didn't, uh, had some leadership that really didn't get it. And uh, finally, I just decided one day to say, could you get in our airplane and we're going to fly to Des Moines and we're going to walk the East Village. And it was funny, we walked through the East Village and I pointed out that even just a decade before, it was pretty much of a dump. Nobody wanted to live there. It was the greasy uh, side of the river. And now it was this vibrant, cool, hip factor, kind of like Nubo is now for CR. Uh, and and that, that was really a, a tremendous asset to the community. And the mayor, who is an engineer, I'll just leave it at that, uh, walked around after a couple hours and we finished at lunch at a rooftop bar in the Republic at our AC hotel. And she looked out and she goes, you could have talked to me days and nights. I wouldn't have gotten it. But this last two hours walking through the East Village, I get it. And I think sometimes you just have to lead the horse to water. Yeah, that's a great point. And that Mike, the the AC Marriott there is a great, great example of a catalytic project. It's a it's a great property, and um, I think you know you ask my wife by nature. I'm a very impatient person, so the the hardest thing for me to to have learned over the last few years of getting into real estate and some real estate development is just the importance of of patience and taking the time uh, to build coalitions to talk to various stakeholders, whether that would be folks at the city or city council or neighbors or other business owners, whatever that might be, and just that sort of patience and working on these things. And, and, and like, like any great project, if it was easy, anybody would do it. So, you know, the, the really good ones, the, the ones that can be home runs are the ones that you really have to, to take the time and, and, and talk to various people and, and get the right sort of input and, and, and work your way through. So um, again, it just kind of some of that fortitude and, and visionary thinking and, and building the proper coalitions, I think are really important. Awesome. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, you know, kind of going back to how projects have been impacted by COVID-19, um, how have you seen, what does it take to make these developments move forward in this sort of uncertain environment? Um, and, and how has the kind of ongoing public health crisis shaped the planning and development processes? Yeah, kind of jump in first. We're working on a project partnering with uh, Joe Amon, who's this local Cedar Rapids developer, on redeveloping the the nine acres, the uh, formerly of the casino site in Cedar Rapids. There, called First and First West, and we were awarded the bid on that through a public uh, RFP process um, right at the end of uh, 2019, and going, of course, going right into COVID. And uh, I think the thing that we've learned is just, and then the ratio kind of layered on top of that is really kind of put fits and starts to, you know, working with the city to to finalize the design. I think the important thing that we've noticed on a bigger, larger kind of mixed use development like this is just the importance of constantly just, it's constant pushing and prodding and pulling and just that kind of constant momentum I think is critical. It's scheduling the meetings, they can't be in person. So Zoom and those touch points and getting the folks from the city involved and all the, uh, everything else and just constantly kind of pushing on it. And again, kind of having that awareness and not getting frustrated that it, 
it's not moving the same it was as it was prior and just sort of having a little bit more patience and just that a continuous little push on on every little detail I think is is really important right now and and just that realization that it is more challenging that you know to, to do business right you can't meet in person and communication is more challenging um, and just you know trying to uh, that, that constant sort of uh, a push on it I think is really important We're working on a project in the market district, uh, this kind of south of the existing East Village in Des Moines, and it does include an office component. One thing that I think will be a, a permanent change, and I think sometimes when we go through these crises, as we as we say, we talk about new normals, and they <clears throat> don't turn out to be uh, long-term trends. But one thing I think will have an impact, particularly on space is the emphasis on uh, what's called the healthy building movement. In fact, there is a book that I would recommend anybody that's doing office space or any other kind of shared communal space. It's called Healthy Buildings, uh, where there's much more of an emphasis on uh, air circulation, air purification, natural light, and other things that make a building healthy to the people inside. Uh, whereas I think in the past 25 years, there's been or even 30, 40 years, there's been more of an emphasis on uh, energy efficiency to the detriment sometimes of making the building as healthy as it can for the people inside. And the building says, uh, you, know, you spend $3 on the utilities, $30 on your space and $300 a foot on people. Uh, where should you put the emphasis? And I think healthy buildings is a long-term trend. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, you touched on this already then, Mike, um, but that leads me right into my next question of, um, you know, how might the pandemic and public health needs factor into developments long term? Or, you know, do you think we will see things emphasizing um, outdoor gathering spaces? Will there be less demand for indoor large gathering spaces or um you know, might things be built in such a way that it doesn't foster interaction with a, you know, a whole kind of broad group of people? Well, I'll jump back in because there's kind of a dead silence. There. So, uh, no, I think that it's interesting, uh, you know, as somebody who owns restaurants, full service restaurants that have big exhaust hoods and have negative air pressure environments, it was quite frustrating that we were targeted as somehow the, uh, uh, the the ultimate building where you could get sick, whereas our air turnover is very, very high, and there's other buildings that meet the minimum 20 CFMs of the, of the national code. I think that going forward, it, I think you can, there should be a healthy building rating, and you should have it po be able to post it outside, which is, uh, this is how this is our purification system. This is the air turnover within a building. Uh, and so you can make buildings uh, safe for counterfeit facilities, uh, but you have to consciously design it in that way. And I'll, I'll go back to those quality of life amenities that we look at as part of developments and the outdoor space and just how critical that has been for everybody. You know, fortunately, it's been nice weather out so we can all be outside and enjoy. Uh, but, you know, continuing to see the necess necessity for all of those kinds of amenities. And then I think just that long term planning and especially for some of our communities, you know, we've heard about people moving out of some of our larger cities and they're looking for some place where they have a little bit more space. So I, I think it's imperative for those communities to be proactive and to be planning and positioning themselves uh, to really compete for that talent in the future. I think something our family got reintroduced to is just the importance of kind of, you know, vacationing or taking a day trip closer to home. You know, I think you, I think as Iowans, uh, sometimes we think, of, you know, going to Florida and Arizona or wherever your big getaway is. But I know for our family and our, you know, our four young kids, we, we made a point of visiting, you know, going to different state parks and different communities, you know, close by or heading to a different town and being outdoors, just enjoying some of those things. So I'd like to think that that's something that's probably around to stay and probably each community should uh, be a little bit more proactive and what, what could they offer someone, you know, that maybe in Marion, but someone lives in Des Moines, and they want to come over to the Cedar Rapids area. What's something that they could do for a half day 
you know, with those are great restaurants or bike trails, or all those sort of things. I think, um, I think that'll be a benefit uh, for Iowans instead of thinking about, you know, the trips, it doesn't have to be a, a week long. It can be, you know, a day sprinkled in within, within a two or three days sprinkled out across a month or two. Um, I, I think those little mini getaways, I think will, will be a thing that'll stay around too. And I guess one thing that I would add that my husband and I have personally enjoyed is just really connecting with our neighbors. You know, before the pandemic, we'd wave and say hi. Uh, but of course, with things being shut down, we started getting together with our neighbors in our front yard. You know, we'd set out our chairs and the thing was whoever set their chairs out first, we went to that yard and social distance and then hung out. That continues. Uh, we actually just put a patio in our front yard because we want that to continue having those social connections, meeting our neighbors that are walking their dogs by. So I'm really excited about that part, you know, trying to find the silver lining. Um, and I, to me, if nothing else comes out of this, um, that connection with our neighbors is one, going to be one of the long lasting best things for us. Yeah, and, and to jump off of something you said um, a little bit ago, Bethany, about um, communities being, you know, positioning themselves to be competitive, um, what is some advice that you would give, or, or you know, any, any of you three to communities to position themselves um, to attract new development even after the pandemic? Yeah, you know, I think understanding the housing needs, every community has housing needs, even if we don't think that they necessarily do. Uh, but, you know, we look at a lot of our smaller communities, they haven't had new apartments built since the 70s. You know, for millennials, we don't want to live in a, an apartment that's older than us that hasn't been updated. Uh, so looking at those opportunities, looking at those quality of life amenities, you know, I often say that the pieces that we have in the Des Moines Metro, they're the same things that all Iowans want. It's just on a different scale. So thinking creatively about how we can accomplish those pieces, uh, leveraging the resources in our communities. Uh, a lot of that talent exists. Again, I'll mention Stanton, uh, vibrant downtown with new coffee shop, photography studio, new event space. Um, so I'd encourage everybody to connect with Jenna uh, if you're so inclined. But again, just being proactive and making sure we have all of those different pieces in our communities. At the risk of alienating maybe some folks in the Cedar Rapids area, uh, I think pre-flood, uh, in a lot of ways, Cedar Rapids was the ultimate plant it or forge it community in the sense that they didn't understand the need for an amenity base to attract and retain uh, the workforce of the future. And I think that it seems like sometimes it, uh, the flood could have produced something that only lasted for a year or two but it's not, they've kept it on a roll. I think the classic one for somebody who lives outside of Cedar Rapids is the Cedar Lake project, uh, where they're gonna turn the swamp, what I call the bubbling swamp, uh, that was just to the west of the interstate into a really cool, usable, fun, water-oriented uh, park uh, that, that'll be a regional attraction. And I think having a lot of those things on the drawing board for a community is exactly what needs to be done. And, you know, it, it went from a community that didn't get it much at all to a community that gets it real well. Yeah, I had an old, one of my first football coaches in the NFL, Marty Schottenheimer had this quote, you know, he'd always say winning breeds winning. That works the other way too, losing, losing breeds losing. But I think from a city's perspective, if there's, if you feel if perhaps if something's stagnating and can't, can't get any momentum going, being able to hang a win up on the board that could attract a bunch of other development and just kind of going out of their way to, to get that done, whether that's, you know, a public private partnership or taking all most of it on, on the, on the public shoulders. And whether that's a, you know, a new trail system or some sort of, you know, new building, a new development or investment in the arts and these quality of life things um, hanging a win. And then that is going to attract more the, the private sector, private development, perhaps more so than a TIF or an abatement, just being able to kind of get that inertia and that momentum going. I love Mike's word about a catalytic project, um, just something to sort of anchor in and, and go out there, but say, look, look at this momentum, look at what we're doing and, and being able to kind of take that and then, and then jumpstart, you know, some success from there. Thank you all. Um, so we have another audience question. Um, one of the concerns for community leaders is that the incentives being provided aren't unduly enriching the developer. 
what questions should communities ask to ensure the deal is fair to all involved? Well, I'll go back to my two-way test, which is, uh, is this incentive something that will accelerate something that the community wants or needs uh, that the market might deliver at some time in the future, but with the incentive, you can accelerate that and make it a now project instead of a future project. The second thing I think is even more important, which is, uh, is the developer uh, utilizing the incentives largely to upgrade the quality, uh, the amenities, the, the attractiveness of the space, things that the community might use. Is it going to make something that the market might deliver, but in a much more boring and mundane form? And I think those are the two tests for, for incentives. Uh, when they're properly used, you can get get both of those things. I think, I think as much public, I mean, every developer typically goes through this in every city, but just, you know, a, a public process. I think that's where it's also really important, just the importance of transparency and, and needing to, you know, like Mike said, point, here's, here's our gap here. Here's where we need some, some city assistance. Here's what it's going to accomplish for the community and, and having a public forum where the developer goes and, and shares that mission. I mean, maybe I'm a little bit too naive, but I like to think that a lot of, a lot of developers, especially in Iowa are, you know, genuinely uh, doing it for the right reasons. And, they're, they're in it because it is a business. So they also need to make money and then you need to put together a, a pro forma where it works. But I, my thought would be there's most of the time, it's not just a developer trying to pad their pockets with an extra, you know, a few million bucks. It's really that this gap does exist and they, they want to make a really successful long-term project. And these aren't projects that you're doing, you know, for a year or two or three years. These are things going to be a part of the community and risk that a developer is going to take on for decades uh, to come. So I think, um, just that open dialogue and just that public process, I think, is enough to sort of hold a developer uh, responsible for, uh, you know, justifying what, what those incentives are. Good. Um, and what are some steps that you all think either local governments or state governments can take to encourage um, new, new developments in their jurisdictions um, or you know, how, how can they kind of fitting it into the big picture of the state? Um, or, you know, can you talk about like ongoing dialogue um, state in the state or locally um, to spur development and how will this kind of fit into the, the picture of things post pandemic? Yeah, well, I would start with having that vision, knowing what you want as a community of, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, so to speak? Or are you happy with how you are, um, or is there more that you want? Do you want to be known for water trails or bike trails or having this charming downtown, you know, really identifying that because then that really helps you hone in on the kind of developers that you're going to be looking to partner with. I think from the, the state's perspective, the, uh, the workforce housing tax credit is critically important. I mean, hard pressed to go to any community and not hear him talking about, you know, affordable market rate housing, um, being in the construction world in and around it. Um, it's, I think it's really hard to build a class B or class C apartment building without some sort of, with the cost of construction um, being what it is. It's hard to, it's hard to build that product and try to get a middle or lower, lower uh, grade rent. I mean, it's, you, you have to, if you don't have any incentive, you're going to build something in order to make your pro forma work. It's got to be class A or higher end um, units that are going to be in the higher end of the, of the market. So I think the state really does accomplish something by providing some of those workforce housing tax credits by making uh, rent and uh, more affordable for, you know, that middle section of, of, the, of the population. So I think that's a very important tool that the state's used uh, to their disposal and has really served to, provide, to put more supply into the market for uh, that kind of market rate housing. I know on the Guarantee Bank project, as I said, we were gung ho in the first week of March, and we're still working now hard to get it back on track. But uh, one of the things that was critical to that project was uh, taking the two historic buildings and uh, having the state uh, historic preservation office take a proactive, positive, can-do attitude rather than, oh, here's 55 hurdles to, to redo an old building. Uh, it, 
in that classic case of the, the historic tax credits weren't going to go into our pocket. It was going to go into dealing with an old, old buildings that were difficult to, to work with. And uh, I think anybody that's gone through an historic project quickly learns that you don't pocket that money. <laughs> or if you if you believe that you're gonna you're gonna get a rude awakening, and so in that case, uh, because it was seen as a catalytic project, uh, the critical people at the state level stepped in and and shepherded it through. And that kind of sometimes hand holding the complex pro projects uh, has to be done on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and for developers, um, how can developers look forward um, as they proceed with proposals, um, you know, in this sort of uncertain environment that appropriately factor in public health needs um, when we, we don't really ultimately know what the future will look like? Well, I'll jump in again because I couldn't take the dead air there. Uh, I, as I said, I, I, I don't really believe that there is going to be a new normal. I think there's going to be a heightened awareness of how healthy a building is and how healthy an environment is. And, and I think that, as I said, it will transform perhaps the way that the economics of a building and, and the infrastructure of a building is viewed. And I think that one of the things that uh, going forward, if you're going to build in the 21st century post COVID, you need to let the, the occupant of a building know all the attributes that you've done to make it different than the pre COVID building. And I think that's, that's going to be here to stay. Oh, and, and did you all have any, um, you know, from your experience working with all these different, um, you know, communities, um, do you have any success stories to share about, you know, innovative partnerships, either with nonprofits or, you know, developers, local governments? Um, you know, I, I know, Bethany, you've talked about Stanton, but um, any other things that come to mind for you all? Yeah, I mean, I, I could jump in. I mean, a big a big part of our backbone um, at Big Grove and the restaurants that I'm involved with in Iowa City as an investor and owner of uh, Pullman Bar and Diner and St. Birch Tavern, and as Mike can attest, the, there's there's development. Even though you're not maybe not putting a building into place, you're developing a new concept and you're working around physical space around internally the physical space and transforming it. Really, the I mean, the collaborations and partnerships have really been a backbone of of what we've done. Um, whether it's you know collaborating with the arts and culture community in downtown Iowa City, we've done you know pop-up dinners with the Englert Theater and Mission Creek Festival and and film scene the Independent Movie Festival. Really leaning into that, you know, we've identified that really early on about what makes downtown Iowa City really unique and different and special is the the arts and culture and uh, the literary uh, tradition that's there with it being a UNESCO City of Literature and, and really trying to lean into that. I mean, a lot of times these restaurants and and hotels need to really reflect the char unique character of a place. That's what makes them special. Um, so we've really tried to adapt our, whether it's something in the menu or the design or events that you're doing or collaborations and really try to make what we're doing a part of the community on a regular basis. And we really view, especially at Big Grove in Iowa City where it's a very expansive, both indoor space and outdoor space, viewing it as a, as a community gathering spot. It's not just a place to come and uh, have, a, have a cold beer, or have some food, it's a place to, um, you know, sit down and celebrate, uh, you know, someone's retirement or, you know, talk through a business meeting and during the Duray show and no one had power for a week and, or two weeks in Cedar Rapids, people were coming down and doing their work there. Thankfully, they weren't showering in the, in the sinks in the bathroom or anything. But um, the, I think looking, continue to look at these spaces, you know, public spaces probably will be, uh, you know, changed, altered to a certain extent of how we view them. But, you know, I think it, for me at least, you know, COVID has really served as a really stark reminder of how important these community uh, public gathering spaces are. Um, you know, you talk a lot about the third, the third place, right? You got your home and your work, and there's these third places that we all gather and hang out. Um, and I don't know about everybody else on the, on the call here, but I get pretty darn tired of working out of my home, you know, <laughs> and, and they weren't letting me into my office. I want to go somewhere else and be around other people and be in vibrant kind of 
uh, community spaces. And, um, you know, I think for me, this COVID has really, uh, you know, reiterated to me how important those sort of things are. And I'm with Mike. I mean, I think as soon as we can allowed to, I think that the normal will, will kind of reemerge and folks will be, will be coming back and, and maybe even, you know, yearning for these sort of spaces more than they were before. Um, and it's beholden upon us as developers and business owners to kind of rethink them, how to make them more safe, how to make them more attractive, more comfortable. How do you lean into the natural environment perhaps more, um, you know, the, the human oriented experience of these places. And like, like any business owner, you got to be creative and adapt and, and think your way through that to make it work. So um, I think, you know, for us, again, it, it comes back with on those restaurants of, of being collaborative and being, being able to be uh, nimble enough to kind of change as you, as things move forward. Yeah, and piggybacking off of that, uh, we are involved with a beautification project up in the Iowa Great Lakes, Okoboji area, uh, of course, focused on landscape, public art, but we've seen a lot of success from that, thanks to the partnerships we've been able to establish with those local groups and, you know, similar for other uh, developers as you're looking to go into a community that you're not local to. Uh, it just gives you so much more credibility. So in Okaboji, we've uh, partnered with the local uh, art center. We've partnered, partnered with the historic amusement park there uh, with the trails board, uh, looking at conservation, all of the communities, of course, uh, and then also Lakeside Lab. So building on those partnerships and trying to have as much uh, bandwidth across all of those entities and really support those existing entities as much as possible uh, gives you a lot more credibility into some of these newer markets that you may be going into. It's interesting in my lifetime to watch how metropolitan planning has changed from uh, you put, you know, you had an area where you put the residential and then over here you had, you had your offices and then here you might have had retail and services and you kept them all separate and, and because that was cleaner and, and, and mixing them all together was messy and, and, and clustery and didn't make sense. And today I think communities have come full circle and realize that I know it's cliche to live, work and play, but uh, to make a vibrant interactive area where people can actually be part of the community and not just get in the car and go to another use. I think I personally, we look for a community that gets that. Communities should look for developers, conversely, that get that and want to be part of uh, understanding that going forward, development can't just be same old, same old, but it has to be experiential. Yeah, I know. So we only have about 10 minutes or so left. Um, so just a reminder for everyone that you can send any questions you have using the Whova chat feature before we wrap up here. Um, so yeah, kind of going back to something that you said earlier, Mike, um, about you know attracting a younger population, your um, your workforce base. Um, what advice do you all have for communities and um, you know trying to attract developments that will um, you know help them recruit? skilled workers or, you know, encourage people to live in their communities or, um, you know, attract new tourism to their communities? I would say for the community leadership, be willing to step out and take a risk. Just because it hasn't been done in your community before doesn't mean that it shouldn't be. Uh, you know, my, my boss always likes to say, you know, is it a tattoo? Is it permanent? You know, there are things that <laughs> You know, you can try um, and, you know, there's temporary things that you can try um, to do a test run, get the community comfortable with these ideas and then go from there. So, you know, people are in those leadership positions for a reason. And I would challenge the leaders on this call today to step out and take those challenges. Yeah, I think a lot of times, I mean, a lot of good ideas or at least the restaurants I've been involved with are stolen from other places. So what I always enjoy doing is traveling around the, you know, United States and how someone designed in a menu or how's, how'd someone build that one building or what is the look and feel of this one district in a, in a certain town and kind of pull little nuggets. Now you can't just take, because it worked someplace and plant it in another place. But um, what I found the most successful entrepreneurs or business owners or developers that I know are usually the people that are really, uh, aware and the best observers and the folks that can really have a good understanding of what people want and what fits and what works. And they're just 
you know, really, really observant about the, the world around them. Um, and I think that's probably what every community can continue to do a really good job at is sort of, you know, studying and researching and listening and, and watching and kind of seeing, you know, what are some little nuggets that you can sprinkle in, in here and then taking that back and adapting that to their own community. Cause you, and, and again, making sure it's customized to, to what their needs might be or what their people want. But, um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of great ideas out there and, um, I'll be the first to admit that I've <laughs> tried to steal or, or, or reuse a bunch of them. But um, again, it just comes back to being really observant and, and, and taking it back and applying it in your, on your own home turf. I'll reiterate that. I used to give a presentation at, at community development uh, seminars called uh, Steal It. It always got a good crowd. <laughs> people wondered what the hell it was going to be about. And basically, I said you had to become a thief. And the old saying was, creativity is undiscovered plagiarism. And there's some truth to that. Uh, you take a piece from here and here and here and here, and you kind of put it together into a new recipe, but uh, you hope to have a small part of it that's original. I always tell communities, go find a success model that, that, that you can, it maybe is five or six or even 10 years ahead of you, and see what they did. What did they do? I mean, when I took that one group of civic leaders to the East Village, the mayor then looked at me and said, I get it. They said, but where did they start? And I said, well, uh, Matt Anderson came over to the lunch uh, from the city of Des Moines and said, we started by improving the public infrastructure. And that seemed to be a catalyst to get some buildings going and then we got a momentum going. But that's always a good point is find that success model, go ask them how they got it started and what was critical to keep it rolling. Do we have another audience question here? Uh, do you do you engage the next generation workforce? Um, you know, a, a high school student in development projects, and if so, in what ways? Anytime we're going through a, a visioning process, and and not necessarily on a development project, but we really do try to have a good cross section of the community, and we do include high school students. You know, if if we want them to come back, you know, if they go off to trade school or college, you know, we want them to come back to those towns or, you know, maybe they just choose to stay there, but we want to know what will uh, entice them to do that. So yeah, absolutely. I think it's critical that we engage young people in our processes. Well, I, I can make a joke about are you talking about people under 40 or under 20? <laughs> I'm at the age where most everybody seems young. Uh, but uh, no, I think you have to have a, a broad group. And I think that one of the reasons that Iowa was fairly stagnant 30 and 40 years ago was that community development was led by people with hair color like me right now. And they didn't engage a broad spectrum of the community and really ask them what they needed. And I think the successful communities in this state are doing that now. Yeah, that's a great point. Just kind of piggyback on that, Mike. You know, not to use too many restaurant analogies, but you can't, you, if you're, you own a restaurant and you have a chef, you can't cook what the chef likes to cook, right? You have to maybe allow them every now and then to make a special, you know, foie gras or something on a Saturday night. But I mean, you gotta, you gotta match match what the community wants, what, you know, and, and people that live in your community from all ages, right? And I think in Iowa, especially, we have this great intergenerational opportunity where we need to create, this is a very, we all know it's a great place to raise families and we get the boomerang folks that go and move back with their kids. And we have, you know, you know, an aging population. So we need, we need to create um, developments and spaces and public spaces that appeal to everyone um, of all ages as well. Not just something that we want to do, you know, as a developer or someone in city government, but stuff that, these people want to do and making sure that that we're uh you know making a, a dish or a meal that, that that they want to eat right so i think mean, that's always something to take a step back and, and ask ourselves in development are we doing this because this is cost effective and look good on a, looks good on a performer or because we saw it in some other place or are we doing this because we've identified that there are people here in this in this market area that that want this particular product i think that that's always really important uh, for everyone to do and, you know, one thing we find is that the things that the different generations want are oftentimes the same things. You know, many of us like the livable, walkable, mixed use areas. We just may use them at different times of the day. 
That's a good point. Uh, I, I When I came back uh, in 1978 from the East Coast and law school, I didn't think I was going to live in Iowa for the next 42 years. And when I came back, uh, if you used Iowa and cool place in the same sentence, it would have been an oxymoron. <laughs> and I'm proud to say that I've lived long enough to see that Iowa and cool places are not an oxymoron if you use them in the same sentence. And I think we maybe underestimated how cool and, and a fun place to live we could be. And I think we're finally starting to get it in the last 10 or 15 years. Yeah, I think yeah, that's a great point. And perhaps COVID provides a, a, an opportunity to accelerate that. If you're seeing folks that are leaving big cities and are tired of living stacked on top of each other and paying $4,000 you know, a month in rent for a 800 square foot apartment, maybe they, they would appreciate all the things that we, that we love about Iowa back here, the ability to spread out and the, and the clean air and the nice people and, and those sort of things. So I think, you know, sometimes we're too humble as Iowans. I think we've kind of gotten into that habit, but maybe it's time for us to kind of re-inventory our assets in Iowa and all of our different communities. And how can we amplify those, develop around them and, and make ourselves even more appealing and market ourselves in a better way to those folks that are maybe looking for a change of scenery. Mm -hmm. so, yeah so we just have a couple minutes left here um we can wrap it up with final takeaways you all hope that um our attendees here whether they're you know community leaders or developers um you know things that folks can do um to encourage growth and development um you know wherever they're from I would say uh, developments don't happen in a vacuum, so it's imperative to engage the community. Um, like I said earlier, understand what your vision is for your own community, um, and then be willing to take those risks. I mean, development is inherently risky, uh, but you know, as we've seen some of these success stories, it will hopefully pay off. Contrary to popular belief of, of, of a lar fairly large group of people, uh, people that do what we do, uh, speaking on behalf of my fellow participants here, not knowing them well, but I can tell that they share my, my mindset. Uh, there's a lot of us who really want to do things that, that are experientially fun and special and things that we can point to years later and go, yeah, I would part of making that happen. My company was part of that happen. And uh, those people, those communities are out there. The, the developers that can help make those communities bring that about are out there. Uh, they just need to find each other. Yeah, that finding each other, I'd like to think is probably a little bit more easier here in Iowa and some of our communities as it would be in a Philadelphia or New York or San Diego or Denver, right? I mean, maybe that's a unique advantage that we have is the ability to connect government officials and People that care about a community with a developer or someone from the private sector that's looking to to do a project so i would just encourage everyone to continue to, to work to connect and if a city has a, an idea you know find five people developers that have done it somewhere else and give them a call don't be afraid of uh making that outreach all right one last, one last request i got my one my son lives in des moines my daughter still lives out in new york city area in stanford connecticut could everybody make in Others, can you all say, uh, Katie, you need to come home. We want you here in Iowa. <laughs> Absolutely. Come on back, Katie. <laughs> all right. Well, that's a wrap on our time. Um, thank you all attendees for listening in and special thanks to our panelists for being here for the, this discussion. Um, please stick around the conference for our um, sit down with Governor Kim Reynolds here in a few minutes, followed by our midday keynote from Ronald F. Ferguson. Um, and you can pick things back up on the community development track starting at 3.15 p.m. with the Immigrants in Iowa session, um, you know, in the Hoover app. Okay, thanks you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.